Some other problems you have with sensory is cannot screen up background noise. They have a difficulty hearing when there's a lot of background noise. And then the speaker at lunch talked about being mono-channel. Uh, and I'm really horrible about remembering names because I can't visualize them. Uh, either have to look at something or have to hear something. They cannot do both at once. Another problem in very severe sensory is body boundary. Like if you touch this, I can't tell where this table begins and my hand is. I don't have a body boundary problem, but there's some people that do. And people that have the visual problems that I talked about earlier, they'll be an auditory thinker. They'll not, they're, going to learn, they're going to learn best through their ears, not through their eyes. I'm the one that's going to learn best through my eyes. Kids that draw really well, they're going to learn through their eyes. But a lot of your nonverbal folks may learn better through their, through their ears. It's going to be variable. And if you're working with nonverbal older children than adults, I recommend you get Tito Makapatahe's book, How Can I Talk If My Lips Don't Move? And this is a person that's nonverbal. He looks very low functioning. And if you were just to see him, you'd think he's totally low functioning. He can type without being touched. And um, he tells you about a fragmented, jumbled sensory world. Strongly recommend that book. The, his first book, The Mind Tree, doesn't go into all the sensory. It's his second book that you'd want to get. Scientists have learned a lot about the brain. Sensory problems are real. It's about time a scientist started studying this. There's immature um, areas in the lower brain areas. But one of the biggest things that's different is abnormalities in the circuits in between different brain regions. You know, the brain has different departments, and you've got to have interdepartmental communication. Word-based tasks tend to be processed back in the more primary sensory areas. And the frontal cortex tends to be used less. And if you want to look at some of the research, go to PubMed, P-U-B-M-E-D. P-U-B-M-E-D. I want to tell you some other good databases. Google Scholar. How many people have used Google Scholar? OK, well, a lot more people need to learn. Go to Google, type in Google Scholar. It will bring up the link. You can go to Google, type in PubMed. Those are two good link, uh, links that you want to do. If you want animal behavior research, you want to go to Cyrus.com. C-S-I-R-U-S. When you hear a word, see a word, speak a word, or think about a word, say different parts of the brain are turned on, well, you've got to have interdepartmental communication. I like to visualize the brain as this big office tower. Up at the top, we've got the president up there. And that's the frontal cortex. That's the brain's executive function. Division vice presidents, that's language and verbal thought. Down below that, we've got visual and music and math, all the good geek stuff. A little further down in the basement, you've got the emotion. And then you've got the big incoming data lines. You know, that's where we got a lot of problems. There's a lot of scrambling on information getting in. Now, when you look at the interdepartmental communications, those stupid suits up in the tower there, they might be lucky to get one dial up because us techies down here don't like suits anyway. Now, there's evidence that verbal language covers up things like mathematics and visual thinking. In fact, in Van Gogh's painting, Starry Night, it's all swirly up in the sky, some mathematicians analyzed those swirls, and they fit statistical models of turbulence patterns in water. I don't think Van Gogh knows anything about math. OK. Now, this is a root map for the interdepartmental communications of the brain. I mean, sort of look at it as brain airways. And on the right-hand side, you've got the East Coast, where Chicago ought to be, that's the emotion center. And the West Coast, that's Silicon Valley. What tends to happen in the autistic brain is you cancel a bunch of flights on the East Coast, and you cancel a bunch of flights to Chicago, <laughs> but you might be adding flights out in Silicon Valley. Because there's a lot of people with Asperger's and the high end of the autism spectrum walking around Silicon Valley. <laughs> I've been there, and I've seen them. Now, one of the problems we have sometimes with emotional regulation outbursts is the front of a lot of flights got can if too many flights get canceled to Chicago, you lose top-down control to damp down emotion. And when I was in, uh, 14 years old, I got kicked out of school for throwing a book at a girl who teased me. And I can tell you, high school was the worst part of my life. And I had to switch from anger to crying. I had to switch emotions. 
It was an important thing that I did this, because I had a lot of social problems at these meat plants, but I never retaliated in anger. I'd go hide somewhere and cry. That saved my career. Now this picture was done by a person that got a type of Alzheimer's disease that destroys the frontal cortex. And as the frontal cortex is destroyed and the language parts of the brain are destroyed, art talent came out of some guy who installs stereos in cars with no previous interest in art. You see the sort of the more pattern thinking, the art thinking, the music and that stuff, it's sort of buried underneath. This is a picture that a nine-year-old drew in perfect perspective. One of the things about the autism spectrum is skills are uneven. You'll be good at one thing and bad at something else. That's kind of universal. Now there'll be different patterns of what you're good at. I'm good at visual things. Kids that are going to be visual thinkers when they get to third or fourth grade are going to be good at art. Now I'm always getting people ask me, how do I know what my two-year-old's good at? I go, wait a minute, they're too young. When I was four, the Valentines I painted at four, they were rubbish. I remember painting this one Valentine, it really was rubbish. It was just little kids kind of junky art. And it wasn't until I got a little older, third and fourth grade, that I made a beautiful horse sculpture, you know, where some of the uh, really good things came out. But we got to build up on that area of strength. My art ability was really, really encouraged. And you got to encourage the kids to do lots of different things with art. I used to just um, you know, paint pictures of horses all the time. Well, I was encouraged to do other things. You've got to broaden it out. The kid likes horses. Well, then let's do a picture of the stable, or let's do some mathematics with horses. Let's read about horses. You know, broaden out that fixation. Use that motivation of, a fix, of the fixation. And this is a picture from the Little Rain Man book. This is a really nice book for, um, uh, you know, elementary school kids to especially learn about the visual thinking kind of autism. And he drew a movie projector reels inside his hat. See, my mind is like Google for images. And that was a big asset in my equipment design work because I could test run equipment in my head. I thought everybody could test run equipment in their head. <laughs> I didn't even know it was a special skill. And there's the dip fat that HBO perfectly duplicated for the movie with Claire Danes. And I think Claire Danes did an absolutely fantastic job. <laughs> but the thing I really loved in the movie is they duplicated all my projects absolutely exactly built off the original drawings. In fact, the scene in the conference room with the um, people all around the drawings on the table, those are my actual drawings that are on that table. I Xeroxed those drawings for them and sent them five copies. <laughs> and the geek side of me really likes that. And I just want to let everybody know that the DVD will be coming out in August. And, and the title's Temple Grandin, so when you search for it on Netflix or whatever, that's the right thing to search for. And there's the drawings that I did back in the 70s to build the dip fat. Now, a lot of people thought I was really, really super weird. And the way I got respect was I showed my work. I had to sell my work and not myself. Okay, there was a discussion this morning about the HR departments. And, you know, you need to try to short circuit that and somehow get your portfolio right into the next right into the technical staff, to the people that could really appreciate it and sort of bypass it. We've got to start finding back doors. Every single project I ever sold, I sold with a portfolio. They looked at, and I sold with reference letters. You now once I build up um, you know, jobs, there's another one of my drawings. I always like to show my drawings off. <laughs> and I learned early on when I was at the agricultural engineering meeting in about 1975, when nobody wanted to talk to me, I whipped out my drawings and then I got respect. And there's a job I like that I designed up in Canada because I love to fantasize that a thousand years from now, the archaeologists are going to be speculating about the purpose of this design. <laughs> now, how do you form categories? You see, my mind is just all filled up of all these individual, specific pictures. So how do I, um, uh, uh, how do I form a category? How do I form a concept? Concepts have to be formed by sorting pictures into boxes, into files. And this is from the same little Rain Man book and he's sorting cats and dogs into different boxes in his brain. You, take, you see, the thinking is all specific to general. The normal mind is top down, general principle to specific. The autistic mind is specific. You put the pieces together to form the general principle. The concept of a dog is a whole bunch of different dogs put in the dog file. A whole bunch of different cats are put into the cat file. 
So I realized my thinking was different when I wrote Thinking in Pictures, originally back in the mid-90s, and I asked people about church steeples. And I was really shocked to find out that most people see this generalized generic, it should be generic, not genetic, I'm going to have to get that corrected, you know, this generalized generic image of a steeple. I only see specific ones. Now, if I asked you to think about house or car, most people will visualize that, but when I ask you something that you don't think about that much, but you see them all the time, that's when I discovered the difference in thinking. And that's why the church steeple is important. And even if you go to the particular church, most people don't pay much attention to the steeple. <laughs> I only see specific pictures. They sort of flash into my mind like Google for pictures. And they did a beautiful job in the movie showing the visual thinking. There's a scene in there where a bunch of shoes just come up like that. All right, now I'm going to flash up some pictures when the word church steeple is set. And I'm going to do it just like how my mind does it. Local one, the one I went to as a child. Ones in Fort Collins, famous ones, more famous ones. That's how they come up. We'll just do that again, how fast they come up. I'm going to do it just the way my mind does it. They come up just about like this. And then I can hold one on there, and I go, oh, would you like to have a thunderstorm over that? <laughs> I, can, I can conjure that up. But when I hold it, when I just do them like this, they come up as stills. But then if I hold it, I can start turning them in, you know, videos. You want a wedding there? I can, I can do that. I was, um, I was looking at these ads today for all these really weird limousines. I was in this newspaper that I found in the restaurant this morning. Okay, and they had a, like a Rolls Royce limousine and a Jaguar limousine. And, you know, maybe we just have a whole bunch of those pull up to it. You see, and I can, I can put that in there, not just as still pictures, but as video. Now, I have found in talking to most other um, designers I've worked with in the meat industry that they can do a still picture in their mind of the entire plan, but they can't make it run. I can make it run. <laughs> and I used to joke around that I had a gigantic internet connection deep into my visual cortex for, for like a huge graphics card. This is tensor imaging. And then, and I have a gigantic, huge, big circuit there that the control does not have. Now, I want to tell you, forget about doing this at the local hospital. This wasn't done at a hospital. And I just got results today on some more scans that only are done in like a super highfalutin research lab. But it was like a real mind blower to find out, yeah, I got a big graphics card. <laughs> a really, really big one. And when you take another slice up here, look on the right-hand side there. I mean, I've got this great big gigantic thing that the other, other one doesn't have. Now, this is one of the most important slides that I've got, especially if you're working with people on the higher end of the spectrum. I am a photorealistic visual thinker. In other words, the pictures that come up are just like those churches. They're photos. And I absolutely cannot do algebra. There are some kids that cannot do algebra that can go to geometry and trick. And today, talking to the University of Utah today on the phone, I found out that they just have deciphered some other 3D scans they've done on me. And there's a, and there's a little abnormality in my parietal lobe, and it's the same abnormality that kids that have elementary school children have when they have trouble with math. So, uh, uh, yeah, my math department got a little bit, you know, shortchanged. You see, but the thing is, is that it's uneven skills. Now, another kind of thinker is the pattern thinker. This is a more abstract visualization. You know, think chess, think computer programming, think um, uh, origami, geometric patterns, crystal patterns, things like that, pattern thinking. These kids often have trouble with reading. This is the kid that may need to be five grades ahead in math, but needs special ed in reading. I was just in New York and I ran into a little kid who's in, who's in fifth grade right now and um, he wants to get buy a calculus book. And I said to his uh, parents, you definitely should get him a calculus book. So they paid for half of it and he paid for half of it and they ordered it on Amazon. You know, if you make these kids do baby math, they're going to get uh, frustrated and be a behavior problem. But he may need special ed reading. Okay, another kind of mind, and this is a real common on the high end of the spectrum, is a verbal fact mind. They're good at a lot, a lot of writing. They're, they'd be very good journalists. 
and they're often terrible at drawing. They're absolutely not a visual thinker. And then I've got a fourth type down there, the auditory thinker. This is a person that has completely scrambled, oftentimes scrambled visual processing. So they're relying a lot more on the auditory sense. And there can be mixtures of these types. And it isn't until around third or fourth grade that you're really going to see these things. I mean, there may be exceptions to that. But you know, people come up to me all the time and they say, well, how do I know where my three-year-old has ability? Well, you just don't know. 